Welcome to the New Books Network. Hello and welcome to another episode on the New Books Network. I'm one of your hosts, Dr. Miranda Melcher, and I'm very excited to talk about this book that we've got with us today, titled The Invention of Prehistory, Empire, Violence, and Our Obsession with Human Origins. The book has really just come out and asks a lot of quite interesting, quite helpful, and I think quite necessary Uh, questions. So I'm very pleased to welcome the author of the book, Dr. Stephanos Uralanos, with us today um, to tell us about the book. Stephanos, thank you so much for being here. Miranda, thank you so, so much for having me. I've actually been listening to you for some time now, so it's a real (laughs) pleasure to get a chance to um, talk with you myself. Wonderful. Well, with that brilliant introduction, um, can you in fact tell us a bit more about yourself and especially why you decided to write this book? Sure. So um, I'm a historian of concepts. I teach at New York University, where now I also uh, run the Remark Institute. And ever since I started writing, I've been most interested in concepts that concern what we call the human. Um, Concepts that articulate aspects of our humanity, but also, let's say, ideologies and ways in which the human is imagined in particular ways, in particular in quite public ways. So while on the one hand, um, I'm interested in intellectual history of particular problems, there is also this broader sense of what is it that we call human and why. And at some point around, I suppose, a decade ago, I started in two or three parallel Um, levels or in two or three parallel directions. One, I was looking at people who did talk about human prehistory um, kind of by accident uh, or because so many of them do. And at the same time, I was very much wondering in what ways human origins have become really important for uh, um, articulating our humanity, for defining our humanity. And let's say that was the time when uh, Yuval Harari Sapiens had come out. Um, there were all of these other related or relevant books that tell sort of super stories of humanity, and I thought they were all pretty horrible. Um, Jared Diamond's The World Before Yesterday. Then there was the Steven Pinker book, um, Better Angels of Our Nature, and so on. Um, and so from from my perspective, it sort of seemed that there was something to be said around this issue of where, why, and how do we define ourselves by way of where we came from, not at a national level. Historians have talked about that uh, a lot, um, or the kind of invention of national origins, but the imagination of human origins in general. That was the the backstory. And it so happened that um, friends were working also on on the subject, um, Maria Stavrinaki, who uh, now teaches in Lausanne, but used to teach in Paris, uh, prepared, uh, together with a colleague of hers, the big exhibit at the Centre Pompidou on uh, the modern art history of prehistory. And so it sort of seemed that things were were working as they were. And um, eventually I decided to write it as a history of concepts that are quite public, let's say, concepts that people use in passing and very often don't really think about, but concepts that establish these bigger ways in which we articulate research about human origins, but also articulate its meaning, the meaning of that research for us today. Um, And so these were concepts like killer apes, the savage beneath the thin veneer of civilization, ideas about disappearing natives or about primitive matriarchs or, you know, um, totemic uh, murders of the primal father and so on and so forth. So in a a way, the book kind of coalesced once I had the sense that I would no longer be talking about ideas held by individual people, that this would not be about a few famous philosophers, but that I could suddenly talk about something much bigger, namely the way in which ordinary people, but also scientists or people who belong to particular um, political groups, end up articulating without very much noticing it, visions of the world and visions of our humanity. Mm, 
Thank you for that introduction and especially for highlighting the fact that the book is organized around concepts. I think that really is such mm -hmm. a key part of it and does, as you say, open it up. It's not a book that's about this philosopher versus that one. Um, it is, as you said, a bigger conversation. Right. I wonder if I can ask you, though, kind of staying on that point, um, in some ways, obviously, focusing on concepts rather than thinkers opens up things in a good way, but also gives you a lot of concepts to have to think about and, I suppose, choose oh, between. Right. Mm -hmm. How did you decide kind of which ones rose to the level of being in the book? I think a lot of it had to do with a kind of process of accumulation um, and with a process of translating research about people, because at the end of the day, you know, archives are not uh, articulated around concepts. Um, a lot of it was simply translating research about people to research that I would then organize around concepts and then reprioritize. So there are many concepts that ended up on the floor, on the cutting room floor, let's say. So the word troglodyte, I would very much wanted a chapter about the man ape or the troglodyte. Um, so there were concepts like that that didn't make it that ended up getting distributed through the book. And then at the same time, there were people um, where I had done a fair amount of research on them and I couldn't quite figure out a way to cut up, let's say, their work into different chapters. So um, to give an example of what I'm, I'm getting at, uh, I would, in, in earlier projects, I would have normally focused on an author and tried as much as I could, again, you know, without concentrating too much on their story, to move somewhere between their story and the way that their thinking links to an institutional and discursive context. In this occasion, I pretty much tried to see if I could have no chapters around authors which turns out not to be that difficult, um, but it, it, is a, it is a tricky thing to do. And in fact, there's only one chapter um, where I, I caught focus on one author, and that's Pierre Terrière de Chardin, um, the French Jesuit and paleontologist, who had a whole vision of the universe. And in a way, um, there's a reason, there are separate reasons for that. I don't need to, to go into them now, but the, the, the brief version of it is that the Yah himself crisscrossed into different domains of interest in the book. And at the same time, he is not easily divisible because he is such a peculiar figure. Um, you know, he, he, he bridges different priorities. And so he ended up remaining an individual, but everybody else uh, pretty much got um, cut up. So from there on, there were concepts that were needed. I, there were concepts that... I needed to be able to talk about because they had everything to do with the colonial dimensions of the um, human origins project, so if we call it a project. So one thing that I wanted to be able to explain throughout, and this was, I think, much more importantly done at the level of ideas and not at the level of individual authors, is that um, human origins is based much more on an image of the primitive, in inverted commas, um, colonial subject, and particularly of, of indigenous people, um, rather than on research carried out on particular sites or with particular, let's say, ancient um, skulls and, and so on and so forth. So what I wanted to be able to convey was this angle that... Um, European intellectuals and scientists, particularly from the 1830s onward, begin with either particular objects that they've pulled out of the ground, usually skulls or later tools, and also with an imagination of how indigenous people work and live, well, not really work, but how they live in some faraway corner uh, on the planet. So this is very often secondhand information um, that they have. Uh, and then it's it's melded into fantasy. And you can see, and so many of the concepts that I picked were concepts where you can see how people move from imagining this quote-unquote primitiveness of the other uh, and then backdating it back in time. That was, I think, a really key part, at least for me, for selecting a number of concepts. 
then there were key either you know political concepts or just articulations of our shared humanity all of those seem to come and go but in a way it's it was difficult to decide until relatively late what happens to some concepts um, i wanted to to concentrate more on Mm. Well, that, that's a really interesting process. Um, so thank you for taking us through that. Uh, I, I imagined it was probably something like that. There's no way that there's kind of a definitive list that you sort of tick off that process of accumulation and exploration. Um, it's right. really interesting. So thank you for telling us more about it. Right, right. I'd like to pick up on something you mentioned, though, in that last answer of kind of when these investigations into the origins of humanity are taking place, because mm-hmm. you very um, clearly note in the book that this isn't something that humanity or kind of Europeans or really whatever group is that's looking into this, this isn't something that people have been interested in forever. This is in fact something that kind of comes up at particularly the mid to late 1700s. Why then? Right. So there are multiple beginnings. You know, there are ancients who are interested in origins, Lucretius famously and, and others, Um, But that story gets largely left among circles of what we would now call classicists or people concerned with ancients and moderns debates. Um, Gradually, by the mid-1750s, there are multiple beginnings or multiple parallel ideas or, or questions. One has to do with the, let's say, Uh, critique of uh, religion and of organized religion, organized Christianity in Europe, and particularly with a critique of this origins of the earth scenario. So by that point, um, partly due to astronomical discoveries, partly due to a general mistrust of um, religious dating systems, the idea that humanity is relatively young Uh, is no longer satisfactory. And so in people like Buffon, who would say this more privately because you'd get into a lot of trouble, in people like Buffon, you have the early guesses that humanity, and not only humanity, that the earth especially, must be uh, much, much older in the hundreds of thousands of years range, if not the millions of years range, than uh, is usually assumed. That's one angle. The second angle is the classic problem of, you know, if um, the Bible is supposed to have talked about um, all of human origins in general, then what happens with native peoples around the world as they are discovered? And this problem is handled satisfactorily, or at least so the church thinks for a while. But with the Enlightenment, that's really no longer quite the case. And the third version has to do with, let's say, proto-nationalisms of the 18th century and this obsession that, you know, we need to be able to find our own national um, ancients to celebrate. Um, And so particularly with the Germans um, in Europe, particularly with the imagination of the Germans, which becomes so important at the moment when Gibbon writes Decline and uh, Fall of the Roman Empire, um, you do have this idea, not only that there's something about finding national origins, but also that there has to be some way in which these people lived before recorded time. I think that that tripartite line that I just gave, you know, dissatisfaction with church origins, general sense that there has to be some sort of natural origin of of, uh, human beings and and therefore there has to be some explanation that links to natural law. And then that it must be possible to speak about locations of origin, particularly for peoples known to have lived outside of human history, outside of recorded history. That was really the important uh, point. I wanted to add only one more thing to this, which is that What is interesting in this uh, story is that what is assumed is, or what, let's say, late 18th century um, intellectuals, let's say, assumed was that there were multiple beginnings of humanity. So there were origins like Egypt that were known to have been quite ancient and Mesopotamia as well. But then there was also the assumption that, let's say, 
the ancient Germans, the people who were presumed to be natives of Europe, living nor you know north of the Danube, east of the Rhine, those peoples must have lived there for quite some time, and precisely because ancient authors, most significantly Tacitus, were used to discuss them, um, the assumption was that there is a prehistory, which is actually relatively recent, more recent than a prehistory of Mesopotamia or a prehistory of Egypt. And so these sorts of directions, I think, produced logics where answers had to be given. Just as Rousseau would look to the Caribbean and start asking, you know, who is the, as he calls uh, native people of the Caribbean, the Carib, um, there was also a kind of local search. Who are the Celts? Who are the Germans? Who are, um, you know, who are these other uh, groups perhaps imagined as quite ancient, perhaps imagined as more recent? And what is it that they offer about um, humanity, about language, about physicality, about social organization, and, and so on. Hmm. Can I ask you to tell us a bit more about something you mentioned in that fascinating answer? Um, the way in which this isn't happening in isolation, right? At this time yeah. period, we also have, as you mentioned, proto-nationalisms. And one point I think you quite clearly make throughout the book is that any of the concepts being debated around prehistory at any point are telling us about ideas of prehistory, but are also telling us a lot about kind of what's happening when those ideas are being debated. Right. So can you take us through the geopolitics of this prehistory, especially sort of as it transforms throughout the 18th century? Right. I think that the, um, the geopolitics issue is quite clear from early on. So one, uh, or is quite clear to them from early on, one is that there has everything has to do with expanding and competing empires. Um, everything has to do with this image, you know, for example, in France of Tahiti um, or in, 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 you know, of Australia, of Aboriginal uh, people, that's a little bit later. Um, of in Britain with, you know, who are the people uh, and how different are the people, let's say, in Africa from people in the Americas and, and elsewhere. A second version of this really does have to do with a kind of domestic geopolitics. Um, that would link to the nationalism issue. So, you know, by 1800, there is an assumption that modern Greeks link back to ancient Greeks. And as we know from Byron, for example, that they ought to be liberated from the Ottomans um, because, I mean, that ought to, this is the contemporary sense, that they ought to be liberated from the Ottomans because they do speak, um, they do provide a continuity with a glorious antiquity. There are analogous concerns around, for example, uh, Rome and Italy, the relationship between um, the church and the, um, the Roman past for a divided Italy. Um, the same concerns uh, show up about the Germans. What happens in a country divided, which doesn't, which isn't a country, which is divided among uh, many different little lenda and sometimes larger ones like Bavaria or Prussia? What is the status and the relationship between these statelets? So if nation becomes a certain kind of unity, it usually does so around national origins or around language. These are things that are easily uncontestable. They're, you know, the sort of the, let's say we all speak German kind of um, attitude, and so did these glorious ancients. So to some degree, there is a measure of debate regarding this ancient past, not as a past of, you know, growing reason, but as a past of belonging. And if the world is to be cut up in these ways, then the geopolitics in and beyond Europe comes to be imagined as a politics of authenticity and a politics of purity. So there um, we begin to have all sorts of celebrations or critiques of, um, I, th I think you see what I'm getting at. We get celebrations of particular figures and criticisms of others or pejorative treatments of 
others uh, all through the 18th and 19th century. Mm -hmm. That scenario then gets other kinds of buildups um, or let's say other kinds of sediments on top of it as the human origins programs become clearer. So at one level, um, for example, the origins of language creates one set of origins. The origins, the biological origins, once these become an issue in the in the 1850s, 1860s, and so on, those produce a different map. So you, you, you have all these kind of semi-competing maps, and it depends on who you're listening to in order to understand what kind of politics they're going for every time. I mean, I think that's a really helpful overview to just get the idea that sort of geopolitics are intrinsically linked to all of this. And we have to remember that with all of these debates, even the ones Mm -hmm. happening now. But I want to ask kind of in a bit more detail, you talked about how there's these ideas of sort of some groups being um, talked about or in some ways put on a pedestal as pure and others Mm -hmm. having lots of pejoratives thrown at them. Can you talk about um, one on the pedestal first? Because this is something reading the book, I kind of was like, oh yeah, I've heard of that. But then went, wait a second, actually, now that I think about it, it's really weird. Why (laughs) did ancient Germany become one of these icons of purity, the synonym for a prehistoric past that's great? Why was it ancient Germany that had this? And what have been some of the impacts of it? Right. So this research is is due a lot more to medievalists um, than than it is to anything that I could um, say here. But so, for example, with the ancient Germans, the idea usually is tracked back to readings of Tacitus in the 16th and 17th century, which produced this division between Germanic ancients and others. So, for example, Franks and Gauls in the French uh, case. The in the 18th century, this gets established much more forcefully in connections that are made between the people that Tacitus talks about. And Tacitus gives this description of us, the declining Romans, versus the noble, pure, and so on um, uh, Germans. The And the idea is already from Montesquieu, for example, that the overthrow of Rome and Roman law becomes really significant because uh, if there are hierarchies there, there is a kind of natural democracy to the Germans who won't agree to to anything with, with each other. So the Germans are imagined as having lived a kind of national and honestly, you know, almost like an ethnic racial group, regardless of their distinctions. And regardless of the fact that the people who lived east of the Rhine in around, you know, zero CE were very different from the groups that invaded um, the, the Roman Empire later. As authors have shown time and again, those groups were not ethnic or racially unique, but they were imputed in the 18th century as having been ethnic and racially unique. And so you have the sense that on the map, uh, imagine that there is this idea that there's a kind of fount of peoples somewhere east of the Rhine and, and north of the Danube from which peoples or races are entering Europe. That scenario becomes really politically potent particularly for uh, Germans to imagine a kind of ethnic unity and to imagine distinctions, for example, from the Huns. Um, So what follows in the story goes in multiple directions. One version is that the Germans are imagined as those natural brutes, you know, noble savages, basically, who defeated the Roman Empire. That's stage one. But stage two is a later sense that the Germans are the ones who managed to hold Europe, or the ancient Germans are the ones who managed to hold Europe against um, the invasions of the Huns from the east and then the Arabs uh, uh, from, from Spain. So long story short, this produces a racially organized image of Europe in based on 
ancient texts that have very little to do with, you know, like Tacitus was uh, was was not an ethnographer, is the classic line. Um, so these have to do with a vision of Europe transforming and with a vision of Europe as an, an, a space of invasions. Now, the space of invasions is something that I take up later in the book with this imagery, this kind of racial panic of uh, either Asian uh, peoples or Africans are supposedly ready to invade Europe, a, a story that continues to this day, um, generally unabated and, and just as virulent now. But there are other versions of it that then become kind of interesting. And this is why this became so uh, important for me. The second stage is the long debate about the uh, Indo-European linguistic origins. And in a way, as authors write, especially in the mid-19th century, they kind of use this discussion of the Germans, the ancient Germans, to produce an image and an origin of even more ancient Indo-Europeans. So it's as though they sort of backdate the story in order to produce other versions of where did Indo-European languages come from. In fact, when the first debates around Neanderthals begin uh, in the, you know, 1859 through 1863-64, some of the German debates uh, around the Neanderthal do have to do with, is this an even more ancient version of uh, a primitive German? And so that idea of a noble savage becomes let's say, integral to the image of Europe. It becomes integral to a clash between Germanic and Latin. uh, And it becomes uh, integral to a vision of European originality, a vision of Europe as a defensive fortress, of visions of Europe as um, capable of internal transformation, but also in need of proper defenses. Then that's the argument that continues, the racial argument that continues to now. Hmm. Can I ask you about another racial argument that very much continues to now? Um, another concept you discuss in the book that you briefly mentioned at the beginning, the idea of the disappearing native. Um, mm-hmm. How did this, in its kind of initial form, influence practical aspects, so actual government policy, as well as the development of academic disciplines? Right. So on the government policy side, I say very little in in the book, but the basics are pretty clear. If um, natives are disappearing, uh, then, you know, the land is ours. Let's divide the land. That's the, the one scenario. And so there, the idea of native peoples whose populations are collapsing uh, becomes an impetus for further expropriation and at the same time for educational policies that say, you know, either these peoples need to be assimilated uh, into our educational system or, you know, they're the loss is theirs. It's, it's, it was up to them to, to make up for it. So what is the d- disappearing native and why does it, as an image, uh, also have to do with, with academic disciplines? Um, the general sense by the 1850s, and in fact, from much earlier, there are major um, appeals rather than debates already in the 1820s and 1830s, is that native populations... Uh, partly thanks to disease, partly thanks to European violence, partly uh, thanks to their ostensible inability to continue uh, living at the levels expected by, quote-unquote, modernity, um, that these native peoples are, are populations are, co- are collapsing or otherwise disappearing. Now, there's earlier discussions of that in the 18th century in the Americas, but by the 1830s, 1840s, it's pretty clear that these population collapses are from the tens or hundreds of thousands to a small fraction thereof. In the second edition of The Descent of Man, for example, Charles Darwin gives uh, 
several pages, so not the 1871, but the 1874 edition, he gives several pages to describe the population collapse of uh, the then called Sandwich Islands or Hawaii uh, and of the Maori and of, of, of other peoples. The Aboriginal Protection Society has been noting this since the 1830s and has been trying to highlight that uh, this is a moral issue of uh, analogous importance to slavery. Uh, they, they will say, now that we're paying attention to slavery, why is it that we don't look at the plight of uh, indigenous people or Aboriginal peoples around the world? So academic disciplines begin to consider this issue as a question along multiple fronts. One front is, why is it happening? And what are its origins? And so there, Darwinism offers perhaps the most brutal and quasi-eugenic response to the issue, namely that a struggle for existence um, is a struggle between you know, not simply um, animals or plants and so on, uh, but between racial groups and that uh, somebody is going to win it. And this is a non-moral issue. It's just a fact of nature. So that's the one uh, brutality. And it it, it feeds into eugenic policies and the eugenic ideas as they go on. In other cases, you do have uh, ways in which paleontologists begin to wonder whether earlier forms of extinction parallel current forms of disappearance. So, for example, um, the uh, destruction of the Tasmanians, for example, is used and discussed time and time again when, um, quote-unquote, races of man, earlier races of man, become a subject of discussion. And so paleontologists will ask whether particular people uh, who who have been found, whether in Europe or somewhere else, are to be understood in the same form. And this would concern as much Neanderthals as it would have to do with, you know, for example, Java man, um, the Homo erectus discovery uh, of the 1890s. Uh, actually, it's not a Homo erectus; it's a Pithecanthropus. Sorry. So um, there is a suggestion that human history has this series of um, disappearances or extinctions, and that what is happening at present is merely another version of what had happened earlier. And you can see how policy and education and research come to relate to one another, sometimes by feeding into each other, sometimes by offering some version of critique. Mm. No, absolutely. Um, And I think it's that interconnectedness uh, that, at least for me, this uh, concept made the idea that we talked about at the beginning Mm -hmm. of organizing the book by concept come through the most clearly because you Mm -hmm. didn't have to have kind of a section about the government, a section about the academics and then go, and by the way, they're related to each other, right? By organizing it around concept, we can see all of this entanglement. So thank you for telling us, obviously in a highlights version, the book having a lot more detail um, about that. I wonder if we can talk a bit more about Neanderthals because they have come up a few times. Right. (laughs) You talk about our current sort of idea of a Neanderthal being in some ways anti-colonial. Where does that version of this story come from? And why do you think it's currently so influential, both in some aspects of the left, as well as in some places on the extreme right? Right. So in, in the 19th century, the... Neanderthal is generally debated as being somewhere between an extinct race of humans and a separate species. And they can't quite come up with a solution on the subject. They, they, they place the Neanderthal at the limit between one and the other. When the first relatively full skeleton is discovered in France um, in the, I think, 1909, um, the there suddenly is very clear that there's enough um, anatomical difference for this to be a separate species. And from the very beginning, you get this idea that Neanderthals were brutish, that, you know, they stooped, that they were physically bulkier but and had this kind of um, 
oversized head with the big brow and so on. And so the image of them as brutes uh, is built quite rapidly. Um, and again, with colonial references, uh, it's, you know, visualizations are published in the Illustrated London News and France, and they're one harsher than the other. Um, there are even in uh, in Belgium, then brutalizing the Congo, uh, you have uh, artists who build sculptures that uh, make Neanderthals look as ape-like as possible. Now, that's one version. But the same authors also have their doubts. So Marcelin Boulle, who has a discussion with artists regarding his the, his skeleton, let's say, uh, the... Um, the, the, the quote-unquote old man skeleton uh, of a Neanderthal discovered in La Chapelle aux Saints in France, uh, he also gives these explanations that say, like, look, wait, we really don't have a sense that these are brutish beings. Uh, it may well be the case that, for example, they have ritual and burial. That idea gets overwhelmingly pushed to the corner, to the, to the side, so while they know that Neanderthals must have built tools, um, that's not something that trickles out. Instead, what does is this kind of ape man or man ape uh, image. Uh, and then gradually, though there are moments where people will say, look, you really shouldn't think of Neanderthals as a subhuman, uh, this only properly begins in the post-World War II two period. One version uh, is with William Golding's The Inheritors, uh, which is sort of Lord of the Rings in prehistory. Um, there it is the modern, you know, what we would now call modern humans that are seen as the brutish, aggressive, you know, colonially violent figures who um, just ransack through a Neanderthal group. There are also newer depictions, and those aren't like the old dioramas, for example, in the Field Museum in Chicago and elsewhere. And gradually, um, as other authors have noted, uh, including, you know, as, as many authors have uh, noted at this point, including Santa Poabo, um and the author of the book Kindred, whose name is escaping me right now, um, and, and others, the image of the Neanderthal switches to being a sort of uh, image of an extraordinarily capable, uh, super tracking, you know, proto-native of their of, of its own. So I remember distinctly one book called uh, Neanderthals Rediscovered saying like by the 70s, Neanderthals become a kind of super Indian. Um, so at that point, uh, or from that point comes this idea, which is now much more prevalent and much more present that these earlier images were absolutely not only wrong, but politically utterly disastrous. What is generally not recognized is that the current images are also politically meaningful and that these are really uh, tricky images. So, for example, uh, on the right, and not only on the right, you get this image that the Neanderthal is no longer dark-skinned, super hairy, um, you know, kind of brutish looking. The new reconstructions make them look quite gentle and lovely. And the... Uh, we no longer talk about the, the the heavy brow, but about the expanded cranial capacity. And so now you have this idea of the Neanderthals as a small population of people across a vast area who then, you know, end up extinct, uh, to, to put it somewhat crudely. And then you get all these questions. The 2008, 2018 exhibit... Uh, Neanderthal the exhibit at the Musée de l'Homme or Museum of Man in, in Paris uh, had a whole room debating multiple different um, you know, ways in which they went extinct. Now that's all fine and lovely, but every version of these has a political meaning. 
And for the far right, that political meaning is pretty clear. It is how did diversity work for them? They let in the African sapiens, those Europeans generally depicted now as white and so on, let in the African sapiens and look how well that worked for them. So it's a little bit like you get rid of one racist uh, theory only to land right into its opposite, another utterly racist theory. Um, And most of the time, and most of us don't actually have this discussion simply on these terms. We don't sit and say, was there a kind of early genocide or was there a disease component or was there a kind of melding of sapiens and Neanderthal populations? Um, We don't necessarily think in the highly racial terms, but all the possible answers to these questions leave us in frequently very nasty, um, you know, racial terrain, on very nasty racial terrain. Hmm. I think this goes right back to the idea that all of this is about geopolitics or has geopolitics intertwined into it, um, not just in the earlier part of the chronology you're discussing, um, but even if we may not want to admit it, all the way right up till today. So thank you for helping us understand kind of those debates that we maybe aren't having um, yes, I, which is- I think so. I would give another one very quick example, if I might <laughs> interrupt you on this, which is that, for example, the uh, African origins uh, discussions, many of the biologists and other scientists who work on uh, origins have ended up in multiple debates regarding, you know, is there one side of origin? Are there multiple sites of origin? What's the relationship between different uh, species of the genus Homo and so on? And um, they all end up accusing each other of racism in one way or other. So uh, as one of them put it, um, why is it that out of Africa so often sounds like, thank goodness we escaped Africa? And then conver- uh, conversely, uh, the other models appear to speak in, in eugenic terms. So it's a little bit like you really can't get out of these uh, solutions or out of these different possibilities without ending up right back into that same uh, set of problems because we simply haven't, you know, effectively educated ourselves that these ought to be discussions of origins back then cut out from ideas about the today. If this were simply a scientific story, that would be a different setup. But the problem is they were all like, oh my goodness, I'm so, you know, so interested to know where I come from, what my genetic makeup and so on is. But that's a kind of proto, you know, the, the, the eugenic ideas or the racial ideas just creep right in with these sorts of translations of the past into the present. Mm. No, thank you for adding that in. Um, that's incredibly helpful to be part of the conversation. I'm going to ask you now about um, a section of the book that we've perhaps not touched on yet, but I admit coming from a background in war studies um, was perhaps one of the aspects I was most interested in, because you talk about um, when we start to have as a type of warfare, mass aerial bombing, which I admit I wasn't super expecting to come across in a book about conceptions of prehistory. What did the advent of mass aerial bombing do to schemas and ideas about human nature and prehistory? Right. Okay, so um, I too wasn't really expecting it. And (laughs) it it was that expression, bomb them back to the Stone Age, which... Uh, is first appears to be first uttered in the 1960s by Curtis LeMay, no less, um, and then has kind of cropped up again and again. It was said that George Bush said it about um, George W. Bush said it by, about Pakistan um, and so on. But it does actually have a longer uh, story, which I came to discover little by little. One version of that story. Uh, has to do with legal questions. And that is basically that after the Hague, uh, after the Hague Treaty, it is clear that you can't mass aerial bomb uh, or shell earlier on uh, civilian populations, but nobody of the enemy state, but nobody's stopping you from doing this to people without a state. And uh, I found passages from the teaching of international law in uh, from you know um, 
handbooks or manuals for teaching international law, where this is really accentuated in the early 20th century. Now, all of this is intertwined, and this is where I was coming from, with this distinction between civilized and barbarian, or civilized and savage. And so, so long as you can bomb the savages, there appears to be relatively little trouble. Um, the problem is, of course, that quite quickly, people become very scared of bombing in the 1920s, 1930s, uh, partly because of World War I, and partly uh, because new versions and new theories of strategic bombing uh, begin to uh, take hold. Now, the turning point really is, or I would think that the turning point really is somewhere between uh, the Italian invasion and bombing of Abyssinia and uh, Guernica in Guernica in Spain, the German bombing of Guernica in Spain. But all through the 20s and 30s, there's some debate as to whether bombing is the way of the future and a way to, you know, end wars that wouldn't have ended otherwise, given how World War One just wasn't ending for four for four years, bombing an enemy into submission. Now, gradually, after Abyssinia and um, after Guernica, it becomes clear that bombing somebody uh, gives you, if if you bomb, then you become the savage yourself. Uh, that that distinction that the civilized may bomb the savages is no longer uh, in play. So, uh, but this, again... Uh, is turned on its head. So the British will insist on German barbarism. Everybody insists on Nazi barbarism. That's not a big surprise. But it becomes the easiest justification as to why then you can go ahead and bomb the Nazi barbarians. Because, of course, the British and American campaigns um, against uh, bombing campaigns against Germany are, you know, uh, campaigns of, of the utmost brutality themselves. And the uh, bombing and firebombing on Japan, of Japan even before the uh, atom bomb is also uh, a campaign of, of extraordinary brutality. So it is they as barbarians and their barbarous actions that justify us bombing them is the allied uh, logic. And this will, of course, continue after World War II, which is... What I was trying to explain at one level was how do we move to this, bomb them back to the Stone Age? And the implication is, well, if they are barbarians with good infrastructure, then we just destroy the infrastructure. Uh, We're not trying to hurt people. We're just trying to ruin the infrastructure. But in the meanwhile, um, you also have this long discussion of how the 19th century division between civilized barbarian and savage generally, you know, adumbrated to a division between civilized and savage now becomes a division that has to do with, uh, you know, military power, but also with infrastructural development. Uh, And so this begins to build into questions of development and destruction in the post-war period. This is another way in which a concept becomes an, um, you know, a history of a concept becomes a way of telling a much bigger story that spreads across different fields uh, and that sometimes is much more of a kind of public story or a kind of uh, quotidian uh, scenario as people use expressions and as you try to understand where these expressions are coming from. Yeah. And I think also kind of tells a bigger story in a clearer way, because that is a pretty big transition. And just thinking of it in terms of uh, military history or in terms of a particular country's presidential speeches, like doesn't quite help us understand the shift that's happening. Um, So thank you for taking us through that particular turning point. Can I ask you about another turning point that you discuss in the book, please? The entry of women into archaeological fieldwork? Right. Oh, I mean, this is one of my favorite parts of the book, not least, you know, at one level uh, for feminist reasons, but at another level also because it's one of the few parts of the book that aren't just, you know, from 
from violence to horror to drudgery. Um, and so uh, the, the women, there are women doing field work from much, much earlier, and this does need to be noted, but they are few and far apart, and they generally and quickly become, uh, let's say, stars. Margaret Mead is the more... Uh, the most explicit or the the, the clearest case. Um, but in the late 60s and early 70s, you have two things happening at the same time. First, with the expansion of the universities, you have far more women entering archaeological subfields uh, that involve, you know, debates about uh, human origins and gendered human origins. Um uh, at the same time, you have a relative hardening from the late 50s onward of an image of um, early dominant men. Now, it's not that until this point a story of human origins were not was not generally a story of man's origins, but you do have books that both sexualize human origins and emphasize, you know, the, the grand importance of, um, quote unquote, man, as in man, capital M, with, with, with all that comes with that. And so now you have both political debates uh, at the moment of, you know, second wave feminism, and you have intellectual debates as to how you go about thinking about this Um about these origins. I said that things get harder on the man, male man, capital M, a scenario. And that, uh, to me, is relatively clear that in the 30s and 40s, it's not that there's not a privileging of the males, uh, but there isn't a kind of elaborate celebration of this uh, form. Now, instead, you have man the hunter. For example, man the hunter was was not something uh, archaeologists uh, supported in the 30s, 40s, even the early 50s. In the late 1960s, you get to the division of man the hunter, woman the gatherer. And some of these articulations of that image very much sound like a 50s imagined fantastical, you know, American nuclear family. Then you have uh, Desmond Morris as the naked ape, uh, which is all thought around uh, sexual characteristics. Um, and you have, oh, who was going to be my uh, third round? Anyway, we can uh, leave that aside. But Oh, right. And the third version is that there's an elaborate discussion of the origins of violence and the importance of the origins of violence to the human story. That's the killer ape uh, scenario for the most part. And so feminist archaeologists... And feminists more generally first try to attack these images, the sort of grandeur of man, the hunter, the sexualization of human origins in Morris and in, in others, uh, and um, the idea that there is a kind of grand violent beginning, which is where, what we should really be discussing. Uh, then you have a second stage where archaeologists play, uh, f female archaeologists and feminist archaeologists play a bigger role, which is like, actually, we can't really tell very well what gender the hunters and what gender the gatherers were. And again, just to give a, a quick sense of how this plays out even now, every few months, you'll have an article that, you know, either reaches us um, by something like Scientific American or shows up in the New York Times that is like, well, actually, there existed female archers in prehistory and we have this and this and that information. Right, but this debate goes back to the 70s and early 80s. The idea, um, particularly associated with the work of Margaret Conkey, uh, is that in the early 80s, you suddenly have... Feminist archaeologists who say we actually have no direct sense and far too little evidence as to what gendered roles were like in early human history. And we don't have a sense as to what evidence would be required in order for us to speak of these um, distinct roles. And we have to be able to reconstruct social arrangements, not simply give these grand stories of human achievement and, you know, prehistoric men's achievement.
so I'm abbreviating a, a complicated 1970s scenario. Um, but to me, that was one of the, uh, the big, uh, one of the important highlights of the book, uh, that of working on this book, uh, mm-hmm. a moment in which you overthrow one version in order to then say, we actually have to doubt everything and begin all over again. And I think that that aspect of it, the kind of overthrowing really comes through in that section, which to me almost created an even clearer contrast to other things discussed in the book, where it seems like there should also be some overthrowing, but there isn't. There are ideas that come up that then get disproved. And yet the ideas seem to stay around. Like I'm thinking of the cave paintings chapter, for example, where there's this whole idea that it's about shamans and mysticism, which don't seem to be based in a lot of fact. Why do some of these ideas get overthrown, but others stay? Uh, You've asked the question that I find, a question that I find incredibly difficult to answer. Perhaps the question (laughs) that I'm most interested in, you know, at a conceptual or a methodological level too. And that question is why is it not only that, so there are different versions and I want to come back to the shamans. One version, however, is a set of debates that just simply seem never to go away. So um, when I was trying to figure out about uh, origins in the Americas, the earliest presentation of how did, um, you know, how did Native Americans get to the Americas, early debates of that go back all the way to Grotius. Uh, Grotius posits uh, in some kind of debate that it is really through what we now call the Bering Strait uh, that they get through. So then you realize that that version is actually pretty old. And then all through the 19th and 20th century, you have elaborate debates as to, well, is it really the Bering Strait or is it through Polynesian islands uh, that, um, you know, the native peoples of the Americas cross over? And that seems to go back and forth all the time. Now, in that case, I think that simply when you find ways of criticizing one version, you don't like something about the bearing hypothesis, you then switch to the alternative. And I think that with a lot of figures, you know, academic cultures develop in such a way that you know, you try to to complete a thesis, and then you end up with some version of a of a paradigm shift um, taking place there. But of course, that's not a particularly satisfactory one, so you end up going back and forth. There's only one real alternative, to put it uh, briefly. But the other ones are also kind of fascinating, like the shaman story. I have no sense exactly of how that was um, how it was decided that the shaman would come back. Now. Shaman, shamanic theories about cave paintings sort of kind of date to the early 1900s where the way that cave paintings get um, legitimized, let's say, the way that they get authenticated partly has to do with the theory of innate human spirituality. And so the Abbe Breuil in France um, begins to describe a story of you know effectively the the building of a religious tradition in the caves that leads all the way to christianity and he is to this day one of the sort of great stars of uh prehistoric research um that's one scenario but by world war ii or after world war ii the figure of the shaman is suddenly pretty much everywhere you get it's not simply that shaman, shamanic cultures exist. It's that the shaman is a little bit like what levi Strauss says about the totem. Um, once you see it somewhere, you see it everywhere. And very different practices get just sort of bundled into the same scenario. And in the early post-war period, I found it really fun to actually track painting by painting how the idea of the shaman becomes a visual story and article by article, how it is that very specific books create, and articles, Horst Kirchheimer's, Ernesto de Martino's, and others, create this idea of a shamanic culture. I think that the early post-war argument had everything to do ultimately with uh, visions of fascism, Nazism, and totalitarianism. 
That is to say that it was necessary to explain where the leader came from and to some degree to say, in fact, these are primordial structures of human thought and religion in which the primordial human leader, like the fascist leader, holds everyone in a kind of control, while, as uh, Michel Eliade himself, a uh, f- former fascist, uh, would argue communing with the beyond. Um, so on the one hand, you have a kind of transcendence of, of one's natural physical body and the shaman, and then you have a kind of hypnotic culture toward the people one is uh, controlling, supposedly. So that we can see how that links back to a kind of fascist, um, uh, let's say about studies of fascism. But then the idea basically disappears in the 1970s. Um, there is, there are, let's say the the study of cave paintings leaves the, the shamanic discussion entirely behind. It's not that people answer what exactly is going on in religious terms in other religious terms, but they just no longer really talk about shamans. And then eventually, the story comes right back in the nineties and two thousands partly through versions of the stone dape hypothesis that our consciousness expanded by way of mushrooms in prehistory. You see that I'm not particularly fond of that theory. It's like, (laughs) there's like no way of of arguing this or discussing this in in rational terms. Um, But in a way, but so suddenly the paintings are great evidence of this because there are, human animal blends in some of these uh, paintings, particularly when humans appear or when human figures appear, very often these are figures that are half human, half animal. And so they sound immediately like excellent uh, versions of, you know, something simply more than human or a human who crosses into the animal kingdom and comes back. Um, But by now, uh, Jean Claude, who is one of the most respected and, and uh, celebrated um, prehistorians in France today, uh, will say without much doubt that really a version of a shamanic, um, you know, mind bending and, you know, uh, human animal barrier crossing being is really the way to understand the painting. So these things keep returning. And I don't have an exact logic as to how this happens. I don't think that I can, but I do think some of it has to do with, you know, if you overthrow one theory, then it's actually kind of hard to find another. Uh, That's one. And then parallel to that, um, that some images are just wonderfully compelling and given the right cultural, political, intellectual circumstances, uh, they return very, very quickly. Hmm. Which is very intriguing to think about, um, I think, with that particular example, but also with a number of other ones we've talked about. Um, the idea right. that concepts are, you know, even if we get more information, even if we have other ways of thinking about them, the concepts are probably going to stick around in some interesting ways that we may not necessarily think about consciously well at least not until reading books like this we've discussed throughout um, our conversation a number of ways that different ideas kind of are still with us um, either in whole or in sort of fragments are there any other continued costs or legacies that we've not mentioned yet that you want to make sure we include i mean i would say that there are versions of this argument of arguments about, let's say, either native purity, or, you know, where we imagine ourselves by way of these early humans, that, um, you know, they they have a, a, an, an impactful legacy, for example, on the environment. Um, so that would be one. Sp- let me expand on that for one second. I tend to think that if we can't come up with definitions of the human that speak of the present time, then all too often we explain what human beings are on the basis of 
our origins in you know this this kind of prehistoric these prehistoric moments we descended from the trees we learned to build fires uh we made tools and and so on and that image really produces a complete illusion as to what our relationship with nature is and has major environmental impacts it's a little bit like those you know, like those images that you see in tourist guides where you have an island covered in palm trees and everything looks so pure and wonderful. But of course, the moment that, you know, the tourists are there, this is nothing like that anymore. You wouldn't sell the island uh, on the basis of showing a bunch of tourists on it, but it is profoundly, um, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a terrible delusion to believe that that vision of purity really exists. So it is with ourselves as well. If we can't quite recognize our impact on the environment, part of it, I think, meaning in an everyday way, I think part of it is because we like to believe that, you know, deep down we are a little bit like that. We are, you know, beings that are naked before the elements, so to speak, like those early humans would have been. Um, we like to speak of them often in terms of we. We were, we did this, we did that. So I think that that is a serious environmental, um, environmentally impactful illusion. That's one. The second version really does have to do with ongoing distinctions between, um, quote-unquote, civilized and its others, uh, the others of uh, civilization. Um, there... A lot of it would appear in restitution debates and cultural restitution debates now. Who has standing to speak in court, for example, um, and how Native peoples very often have no standing to speak in court. And that would be one um, aspect. And the third and final version that I would say is it does have to do with this idea of our celebration of humanity. I tend to think that that's very problematic, that humanism with a capital H continues to have, you know, profoundly violent effects. We like to believe that that's no longer the case, that we do speak of humanity in general. But again, this is the kind of universalism that leaves some people out and that produces the giant great story that goes back to these, um, you know, that, that goes back to early humanity as though this were a great story of the species of the people that is the shepherd of the universe, that is, you know, um, special, separate, and and distinct. That kind of scenario we see, you know, on the BBC, for example, on the documentaries made by the BBC, whether they include... um, you know, whether they're simply documentaries about nature or documentaries about the ascent of man, to go back to the Jacob Ronofsky 1971 uh, version, more recent ones still continue on this great story of us. And I tend to think that the more that we continue to celebrate that story of man, capital M, or humanity, capital H, the more we will continue to produce the environmental uh, and racial effects that we have seen throughout this story. Hmm. No, I'm, I'm very glad you added that in. Um, I think it is part of a lot of different debates and as it, as it should be. So thank you for highlighting that in this conversation as well. If I can ask a final question, I suppose, um, this one does always feel a bit cheeky to ask, particularly huh? when, as in this case, the book is so just out, um, which makes it especially fun to talk about. But obviously, for it to be so available to readers, that means that you obviously had to finish it a while ago <laughs> to get it through the publishing process. So is there anything you might be looking at working on um, now that it's done, whether or not it's a book, whether or not it's on this exact topic that you'd like to preview? I mean, I think there's one project that um, I have to complete because it's been sitting uh, for a while while I was working on this. And this is a project on the institution of the French Civil Code and let's say the um, let's say the ideological and philosophical premises on which the code was uh, set up and also identified with uh, Napoleon in 
the turn into the 19th century. That project has been sitting around for a while. Uh, but I think in in as a bigger uh, project, a follow-up to the present book, I'm expecting to work again on this idea of a regeneration or transformation of humanity. Uh, so instead of looking toward a deep past alone, the long history through the 19th and 20th century that you could create a new man, so to speak. Um, those are the terms in which it became um, allied to political projects, mostly you know fascist and communist political projects, but also later to anti-colonial ones as well. I'm not entirely sure of what terms this uh, research is going to have, um, but I do think, again, it would be this sort of mixture of science, politics, concepts, and uh, philosophy that the present book tries to work with as well. Mm. All right. Well, based on that alone, we'll have to have you back. Um, that sounds very exciting. So best of luck with that project. Thank um, you, Randall. But while you're working on it, of course, listeners can read the book we've mostly been talking about, which again is titled The Invention of Prehistory, Empire, Violence and Our Obsession with Human Origins. Stephanos, thank you so much for being with us on the podcast. Thank you so very much, Miranda. It was such a pleasure speaking with you.